So welcome everyone to uh, this uh, Linnean Lens, which is an event that um, uh, we set up during the COVID pandemic, actually, uh, in order to showcase items for our collections when we couldn't do any tours uh, and using an external camera that is going to be handled by um, Will Beharo, my colleague and librarian of the Linnean Society here today as well. And it just proved so popular that we've kept on going uh, even after the various lockdowns. Uh, and we now hold it every two months. So every two months we showcase items of our collections um, with increasingly an external speaker who is much more knowledgeable than we are about some items in our collection. This is our second Wallace-themed uh, Linnean Lens of the Year, and it's part of a series of events that we've put in place this year to celebrate the bicentenary of Alfred Roll Roll ah, sorry, start again. Alfred Russell Wallace's birth, um, born on the 8th of January, um, I think, uh, 1823. Uh, previous events this year have already included a tree planting in Usk, in the um, Wallace's birth town in January, uh, and in another Linnean Lens event, which was led by Sandy Knapp on Wallace in the Amazon. Uh, and uh, that Linnean Lens can be found on our YouTube uh, channel, <clears throat> as well this one uh, in the near future. Uh, and future events after this particular one will also include an evening lecture by Jim, Jim Costa on his new book, uh, Radical by Nature, The Revolutionary Life of Alfred Russell Wallace, we've, which we, I think we have just received in the library. Um, and uh, another Linnean Lens on Wallace's library by Jeb Beavers in July. So you can find all of these events uh, on our website in due course. Um, and there's also more events nationwide and worldwide uh, about celebrating this bicentenary uh, that you can find on the link that I will put on the chat in a, a second. And Padma, <coughs> our event and comms manager, who's in the background, has also put in the chat a link to uh, the, our YouTube channel and Sandy's uh, chat. But today we have the great honor of having uh, one of the foremost uh, Wallace experts uh, who has agreed to come to talk to us about Wallace in the Malay archipelago and who will showcase uh, three of the manuscripts that we have in our collections after a PowerPoint presentation. So welcome, uh, Dr. George Beccoloni is a zoologist, an evolutionary biologist and a historian of science. Um, he's worked at the Natural History Museum in London as an entomologist for more than 20 years, and he's currently the director of the ongoing, ongoing Wallace Correspondence Project, which he founded in 2010. So um, thank you very much, George, for being with us today, um, and I'll, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Isabel. I'll just start my PowerPoint. Uh, so share screen. Yeah, bottom of your screen. <clears throat> I think that's coming. Yep. Okay. Perfect. You're good to go. Thank you, George. So um, good afternoon to all of you. I'll start off by giving you an approximately 18 minutes um, overview of Wallace's early life and the most significant discoveries he made during um, his eight year expedition to the Malay archipelago. Uh, Will will then show you three of the notebooks which he kept while in the archipelago, uh, which are now in the Linnaean Society's collection. And that will be followed by about 30 minutes or so for questions. So let's begin. Although Wallace is not exactly a household name these days, he was probably the most famous scientist in the world when he died aged 90 in 1913. During his long life, he wrote more than a thousand articles and 22 books on a very wide variety of subjects. And in these, he made very many important contributions to a wide range of fields, including biology, geography, geology, anthropology, and even astrobiology. His best known books are The Geographical Distribution of Animals in two thick volumes, Island Life, which was a follow-up book, 
and this famous travelogue, uh, the Malay Archipelago, which hasn't been out of print since it was first published in 1869. Wallace was born on the 8th of January, 1823, to a downwardly mobile English um, couple, uh, Thomas Veer and Mary Ann Wallace. Wallace's father was a solicitor, but he had never practiced and been living off inherited wealth, which dwindled as his family grew. Wallace was born um, in this house uh, near the town of Usk, uh, which at that time was part of England and uh, which is now part of Wales. Um, he lived there till he was five, and then he and his family moved to Hartford in England. And it was there at Hales Grammar School uh, that he re received his only formal education. In about 1835, Wallace's parents fell on really hard times. Uh, Wallace was forced to leave school in March 1837, aged only 14. And a few months later, he got a job with his oldest brother, William, who was a land surveyor. Wallace and his brother would do such work for the next six and a half years, roaming all over the countryside of southern England and Wales. In autumn 1841, the brothers moved uh, to the Neath area of Wales. This is a painting that Wallace's brother did of uh, Neath, which was a, a small village really then. Um, and it was there that Wallace's interest in natural history really began. It started because he wanted to be able to identify the plants um, he saw in the countryside whilst out surveying. He bought his first books on how to identify them, and he also began to make a collection of press specimens. In December 1843, there was a shortage of surveying work, so in early 1844, Wallace took a job teaching junior classes in English, surveying, and elementary drawing at the Collegiate School in Leicester. Uh, there's the, the school to the left. The building still survives, actually. Um, Lester had a good library and he was able to study several important works on natural history and travel, as well as, crucially, as we'll see, Malthus's book, Principles of Population. It was probably in this library that he first met amateur naturalist, Henry Walter Bates, who soon got Wallace passionate about collecting and studying beetles. Uh, this is Bates in later life uh, to the right. In March, 1845, Wallace's brother, William, died unexpectedly from a chest infection. And at Easter, Wallace, quit his teaching job and moved back to Neath to continue the surveying business. However, he soon found that running its involved responsibilities such as fee collection, which he really despised. It was in Neath in 1845 that Wallace first read Chambers's controversial and anonymously published book, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation. Uh, there's the title page and there's Robert Chambers um, on the right. Although not a scientific work, Vestiges convinced Wallace of the reality of evolution, uh, which was then called transmutation. A year or so later, he was inspired by a book called A Voyage Up the River Amazon. And in late 1847 or early 1848, uh, he suggested to Bates that they go to the Amazon to collect insects, birds, and other animals for their private collections, selling the duplicates to collectors and museums in order to fund the trip. The main aim of the expedition, as far as Wallace was concerned, was to seek evidence for evolution and attempt to discover its mechanism. Bates liked the idea of the trip and the two young men, at the time Wallace was 25 and Bates 23, set off by ship to Belem in April 1848. At first they worked as a team, but after a few months they apparently quarreled and split up to collect in different areas. Wallace centered his activities in the middle Amazon and Rio Negro journeying up the, the latter river further than any other Westerner had up to that time. Using the skills he had learned as a land surveyor, he made the first ever detailed map of the river. It was published by the Royal Geographical Society in London when he returned home, and it proved accurate enough to become a standard map for many decades. So there's um, on the bottom left is uh, a little bit of his actually hand-drawn map, and uh, the the map above is the published version. <clears throat> By early 1852, Wallace was in poor health and he decided to return to England. Pa passing through Manaus, Wallace found to his dismay that most of his specimens from the preceding two years, which he had been sending down river to be shipped to England, had been delayed by the officials there because they were worried that the boxes might contain contraband goods. 
After declaring their contents, he collected the six large cases and set sail for Britain on the brig Helen on the 12th of July. Tragically, 26 days into the voyage, the ship caught fire and sank in the middle of the Atlantic. The red dot shows where it sank. Taking with it all the specimens he had on board, plus his collection of live animals and most of his field notes. All he managed to um, rescue was a tin box containing a few shirts into which he quickly put his watch, some money and drawings he had made of fishes and palms. Um, the palm drawings are now in the Linnaean Society's collections. Uh, and Wallace and the crew struggled to survive in a pair of badly leaking lifeboats. But very luckily, after 10 days drifting on the open sea, they were picked up by a passing cargo ship, making its way back to England. When they finally got back home, Wallace was pleased to find that his agent in London, Samuel Stevens, had had the foresight to insure his collections for 200 pounds. Wallace estimated that they'd been worth 500, but it was certainly a lot better than nothing. Although Wallace made many interesting discoveries during his four years in the Amazon basin, he did not manage to find the elusive mechanism of evolution. He did, however, manage to write two books in the year after his return, one on the palm trees of the Amazon and their uses, which Sandy Knapp talked about, and another one about his travels, which he had to la write largely from memory since most of his diaries had been destroyed. Shortly after returning to England, Wallace had vowed never to travel by boat on the sea again, but good resolutions soon fade, and about a year later in March 1854, he left Britain on a collecting expedition to the Malay Archipelago, which is now made up of the countries Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, East Timor, and Indonesia. Uh, this map shows Wallace's journeys um, around the various islands um, in black. Uh, so the black lines across the sea show uh, where he went, and he basically went all over the place, as you can see. Uh, he spent nearly eight years in the region, traveling about 14,000 miles and visiting every major island in the archipelago at least once. Uh, this is probably what he looked like when he was there. He and his paid assistants collected almost 110,000 insects, 7,500 shells, 8,050 bird skins, and 410 mammal and reptile specimens. Wallace personally collected about 80% of all the specimens. He focused on the delicate specimens, mainly the insects, while his assistants collected most of the vertebrates, which were much more time consuming uh, to actually collect because they had to be individually shot. Wallace's collection included about 5,000 species new to science, and he personally named 295 of them in 21 scientific articles. He was an expert on the taxonomy of rose chafer beetles um, and um, the pileonid butterflies and period butterflies as well, as well as birds. Uh, these are three of the most iconic species he discovered. So in the bottom left, there's Wallace's standard wing bird of paradise. In the middle, Wallace's golden bird wing from the, um, the Moluccas. And um, on the right, Wallace's flying frog um, from Sarawak in Borneo, uh, which was the first flying frog ever discovered. But unfortunately, it wasn't named because Wallace at the time because Wallace didn't collect a specimen, or maybe he did, but it got destroyed. But he made this beautiful watercolor um, painting of it. He was a, an extremely good artist. And um, actually the, the species wasn't described for several decades, I think, um, after Wallace talked about it in his book, The Malay Archipelago. Um, uh, so it needed a specimen for it to be described. We now come to one of the, um, the we now come to the first of uh, the three most important scientific papers which Wallace wrote during his trip. In February 1855, while he was staying in a small house owned by his friend, the ruler of Sarawak, Roger James Brook, Wallace wrote what was to become probably the most important paper on evolution published prior to the discovery of natural selection. This shows the title page and uh, to the left, is Santubong Mountain, where Roger Brooks uh, little bungalow was. In Wallace's autobiography, uh, he recounts how this paper was written during the wet season and during, and during the evenings and wet days, I had nothing to do but to look over my books and ponder over the problem, which was rarely absent from my thoughts. Having always been interested in the geographical distribution of animals and plants, it occurred to me that these facts had never probably been utilized as indications of the way in which species had come into existence. 
great work of Lyell, i.e. his book, Principles of Geology, had furnished me with the main feature of the succession of species in time. And by combining the two, I thought that some valuable conclusions might be reached. I accordingly put my facts and ideas on paper and sent it to the Annals and Magazine of Natural History. Its title was On the Law Which Has Regulated the Introduction of New Species, which law was briefly stated as follows. Every species has come into existence coincident both in time and space with the pre-existing closely allied species. This clearly pointed to some kind of evolution. It suggested the when and the where of its occurrence and that it could only be uh, through natural generation, as was also suggested in the vestiges. But the how was still a mystery only penetrated some years later. He continues, Soon after the article appeared, Mr. Stevens wrote uh, me that he had heard several naturalists expressing regret that I was theorizing, and what I had to do was collect more facts. After this, I had in a letter to Darwin expressed surprise that no notice appeared to have been taken on my paper, to which he applied, replied that both Sir Charles Lyell and Mr. Edward Blythe, two very good men, especially called his attention to it. In fact, Wallace's paper made such an impression on Lyell he was a creationist, that in November 1855, soon after reading it, he opened a species notebook, in which he began to contemplate the implications of evolutionary change for the first time. Notes on Wallace's paper fill the first pages of this notebook. In April 1856, Lyle visited Darwin, and Darwin divulged his theory of natural selection to him, an idea which had, he had been working on more or less in secret for around 20 years. Soon afterwards, Lyle sent a letter to Darwin, urging him to publish the theory, lest someone beat him to it. He almost certainly had Wallace in mind. So in May 1856, Darwin, heeding this advice, began to write a sketch of his ideas for publication. Finding this unsatisfactory, he abandoned it, and instead began to work on an extensive book on the subject, uh, which is sometimes called his Big Species Book. In May 1856, about a year after he wrote his Sarawak Law Paper, Wallace took a boat from Singapore to Bali. He had no intention of staying in Bali, but he figured uh, he could find a way from there to Lombok, and then on to the town of Makassar in Sulawesi. This accidental detour would give Wallace the second most important discovery of his trip. On Bali, Wallace found similar species of birds to the other islands he had visited to the west, including a weaver bird, a barbet, and a starling, groups which he had seen and collected in Borneo, Singapore, and Peninsula, Malaysia. But then, and I quote, crossing over to Lombok, separated from Bali by a strait less than 20 miles wide, I naturally expected to meet with some of these birds again. But during a stay there of three months, I never saw one of them. Instead, Wallace found a completely different assortment, a yellow-crested cockatoo, as you can see on the right, a loud fryer bird and a megapode. None of the groups of um, birds to which these species belong were known on the western islands of Java, Sumatra, or Borneo. The differences in the mammal fauna of the western and eastern islands were just as striking. On the large western islands, there were monkeys, tigers, and rhinos. But in Australia and nearby islands, there were no primates, cats, or ungulates. Most of the native mammals were marsupials, kangaroos, cuscus, and the like. And by the way, the bird on the, the left is a barbit, um, one of Wallace's specimens. The striking difference between the faunas of Bali and Lombok signified something very important to Wallace. He put his thoughts on paper again, publishing an article in 1857 entitled On the Natural History of the Aru Islands. Wallace explained that under Charles Lyell's center of creation belief, one would expect to find similar animals in countries with similar climates, and dissimilar animals in countries with dissimilar climates. This is not at all what he observed. For example, in comparing Borneo in the west and New Guinea in the east, he observed, it would be difficult to point out two lands more exactly resembling each other in climate and physical features, but their birds and mammals were entirely different. Wallace reasoned further that some other law has regulated the distribution of existing species. That law, Wallace suggested, was the Sarawak law he had pr proposed two years previously. Again, Wallace relied on geology to make his case. He surmised that New Guinea, Australia, and Aru had been connected at some point in the relatively recent past, and so shared a similar 
related set of birds and mammals. Similarly, Wallace deduced that the Western Islands had once been connected to mainland Asia and so share the fauna of tropical Asia, monkeys, tigers, etc. The islands of Bali and Lombok and Borneo and Sulawesi had never been connected, however, or only connected an extremely long time ago because there was a deep oceanic trench between them. Wallace had linked the question of the origin of species to how species were distributed and had defined a dividing line between the fauna of Asia and Australia, which was later named by Huxley the Wallace Line, as you can see on the map. For Wallace, the question was, then uh, was not if species evolved, but how. In early 1858, whilst on the Indonesian island of Halmahira, he at last discovered the elusive mechanism which he had been searching for for the past 10 years. This is an account he wrote about how he made his great discovery. So he says, after writing, uh, writing the Sarawak law paper, the question of how changes of species could have been brought about was rarely out of my mind, but no satisfactory conclusion was reached until February 1858. At that time, I was suffering from a rather severe attack of intermittent fever, and one day while lying on my bed during the cold fit, the problem again presented itself to me, and something led me to think of the positive checks described by Malthus in his essay on population, a work I had read several years before and which had made a deep and permanent impression on my mind. These checks, war, disease, famine, and the like, must, it occurred to me, act on animals as well as on man. Then I thought of the enormously rapid multiplication of animals, causing these checks to be much more effective in them than in the case of man. And while pondering vaguely on this fact, there suddenly flashed upon me the idea of the survival of the fittest, that the individuals removed by these checks must on the whole be inferior to those that survived. In the same evening, I sketched the draft of my paper and in the two succeeding evenings wrote it out in full and sent it by post to Mr. Darwin. And this is Mr. Darwin. Wallace decided to send his essay to Darwin because he knew from correspondence that he was interested in the subject of evolution, although Wallace had no idea that Darwin had already discovered um, its mechanism. He asked Darwin to pass the essay on to Lyle if Darwin thought it was sufficiently interesting. Wallace probably thought that Lyle, who he'd never been in contact with, would be interested to learn about his new theory because it explained the evolutionary law which Wallace had proposed in his 1855 paper. Darwin had, of course, mentioned in a letter to Wallace that Lyle found his Sarawak law paper noteworthy. Wallace's packet to Darwin containing his essay and a covering letter uh, were posted from the small island of Ternate, uh, which you can see in this lithograph, off the coast of Halmahira, probably in April 1858, and then almost arri um, certainly arrived at Down House on the 18th of June, um, 1858. When Darwin received it, he was understandably horrified and immediately wrote an anguished letter to Lyle asking for advice for what he should do. I never saw a more striking coincidence. If Wallace had my manuscript sketch written out in 1842, he could not have made a better short abstract. So all my originality, whatever it may amount to, will be smashed, he exclaimed. Darwin asked Lyle to consult their friend, the botanist Joseph Hooker, and to cut a long story short, Lyle and Hooker decided that the best solution was to present Wallace's essay, along with two unpublished excerpts from Darwin's writings on the subject, to a meeting of the Linnaean Society of London on the 1st of July, 1858, only a mere 14 days after it had arrived in England. These documents were published together in the Society's journal about a month later as the paper on the tendency of species to form varieties and on the perpetuation of varieties and species by natural means of selection. Darwin's contributions were placed before Wallace's essay, emphasizing his priority to the idea. Wallace had said nothing about the publication of his essay in his letter to Darwin, and no attempt was made to get his permission to do so. Uh, Darwin, uh, no, Wallace later grumbled that the essay was printed without my knowledge and of course without any correction of proofs, contradicting Lyle and Hooker's fib in their introduction to it that both authors have unreservedly placed their papers in our hands. This unfortunate episode prompted Darwin to abandon writing his big book on evolution, and instead he rushed to produce an abstract, as he called it, of what he had written up to that point. 
This abstract was published 15 months later in November 1859 as his famous book on the origin of species, which today many species think, uh, many people think uh, was where the theory of natural selection originated. Thank you. Thank you, George. So that was the PowerPoint um, section of the presentation, um, but uh, we're now going to move on to uh, showing you three of the manuscripts that are in our collections as soon as George stops sharing. Okay. Um, so uh, towards the top, if I remember well, uh, you yeah, should stop, have a stop yeah. share. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, Okay, so we've we've got our first manuscript spotlighted here, and Will's gonna. So, for for those of you uh, in the audience, George is currently at home because he's unwell. So we're handling everything at our end. Um, so I'll leave you to to um, to present these manuscripts. Okay, well, thanks, Isabel. So um, you can see the cover of the uh, the notebook here, and Will's gonna open it. Um, so this is one of um, three of Wallace's um, surviving collecting notebooks. Uh, there's one in the Linnaean Society's collection and um, two in the Natural History Museum's um, uh, library. And Wallace kept records of all the species that um, he collected while um, in the Malay archipelago. And they're recorded in these notebooks. So uh, there's different sections for birds, beetles, butterflies, etc. What he used to, uh, what he did, was that for each locality, say Sarawak or Singapore, um, he would produce a numbered list, um, which he would add to every time he found what he thought was a, a, a different species. Um, so a lot of the time, um, these were morpho species, um, which you know he didn't know the names of, um, but he knew sufficiently large amount about the taxonomy of the groups to be able to say, well, this is one species and this is another species. And he often recorded the details of, um, you know, the, the key characteristics of uh, the species um, in question in the notebook. So um, as you can see, this uh, is a, a list of uh, the birds collected in Singapore. And uh, then the species are numbered one, two, three, four, etc. And in each case, he gives a brief description and in some cases, he manages to um, actually identify what the species is. And he also makes notes about the color of the iris and the, the beak, etc., because obviously the eyes uh, would be removed when he stuffed uh, the skin and the beak color would change. So uh, this is a very detailed um, record of all the species he collected. And these numbers are very significant because they appear on the, the data labels he put on the specimens. So. Uh, if you find a beetle that's um, that has SAR on the label, so Sarawak, and it's number 39, you can go to um, the relevant notebook, look up 39, and often find more information. It might say collected in dead wood or something like that. So, um, Will, could you turn to the next set of pages? So, um, Here's some pages of uh, beetles he collected, and you can see he's made drawings um, showing some of the markings on the elytra um, that he can use to differentiate the different species of related beetles. And uh, there's lines um, showing the, the size of the specimens. So it's, uh, yeah, really remarkable um, uh, record of his um, collecting work. And it shows what a remarkable collector he was because uh, he actually had a kind of a photographic memory for animals um, and he would be able to remember you know all the species of chafer beetles say from Sarawak um, and only when he was out in the field and he saw something which uh, looked different um, because it wasn't one he remembered would he you know collect it um, you know, if he didn't have such a good memory, he would have ended up collecting dozens of the same species, but he only wanted a small series of individuals from of each species. So he was trying to maximize the number of species because there weren't that many buyers of these things. Um, um, in those days, there were a few museums and one or two um, private collectors, but actually not a huge market 
Um, there's probably a bigger market today, in fact. Um, but uh, he had to be able to remember, you know, all the, the different species in a locality in order to actually sort them out like this. So th thank you, Will. Um, perhaps we can move on to the next uh, notebook now. So the Linnaean Society has six um, of his notebooks from the Malay archipelago. Um, one of them is a collecting notebook. Uh, one of them is uh, this notebook, which is in, named his species notebook. And uh, the other uh, four are his Malay journals, which we'll look at after this. So th this is a really remarkable um, notebook, um, which was really first studied by a scholar called McKinney in the early 1970s. Um, and Jim Costa, who's an, an expert on both Darwin and Wallace, has actually published a transcription of the notebook with um, annotations on uh, interpreting all the pages. So you can buy, buy this from, I think, Princeton or Harvard University Press. Um, anyway, uh, this is, it's a little known fact that after Wallace wrote his 1855 Sarawak law paper, he started to make notes uh, for a book about um, transmutation or evolution. And um, the notes for this book are actually in this notebook. And if you look on the uh, right hand side at the top, um, he says notes uh, for the organic law of change. And that's almost certainly what the, the title of the book uh, would have um, been. And a lot of these notes are um, criticisms or critiques of what uh, Lyle actually said in his uh, book, Principles of Geology. So uh, Lyle um, believed the, the world was extremely old, that geological change was very gradual and slow, and that species went extinct um, from time to time. Uh, but he had this bizarre idea that God then created new species when the habitats changed. So there was constant acts of creation by God. And uh, Wallace tore uh, his reasoning, Lyle's reasoning apart in this notebook. Um, and if you turn to the next mark pages, please, Will. Yeah, on uh, pages uh, 50 to 51, uh, Wallace writes, uh, it would be an extraordinary thing if, while the modification of the surface of the earth occurs by natural causes now in operation, and the extinction of species was the natural result of the same causes. Yet the reproduction and introduction of new species required special acts of creation or some process which does not present itself in the ordinary course of nature. And then he says, introduce this and disprove all Lyle's arguments first at the com uh, commencement of my last chapter. So last chapter, you know, suggests it was a book and actually, um, he mentioned in both letters to Bates and to Darwin uh, that he was working on such a book. Um, and I have a, a recording actually of Wallace's doctor before uh, the doctor died, Dr. Norman, um, who recalls Wallace um, telling him about uh, this book uh, that he'd been writing, but said that he had ban abandoned work on it as soon as uh, Darwin um, sent him a copy of Origin of Species. So, and he, he never mentioned that in any of his writings, his published writings, that he had been working on this uh, book on evolution. So thank you, Will. Um, can we move to the next notebook now? So um, this notebook um, is one of four uh, that Wallace kept as a journal of his um, travel. So basically an account of um, his trip, eight year trip to the Malay archipelago. <clears throat> and, and he wrote it, he wrote the entries soon after they occurred, maybe um, in the evening of the day or the next day, et cetera. Um, you, can, you can see from what he uh, writes that um, they were written soon after the events. But um, this journal was obviously written in a cr chronological um, sequence, um, but his Malay uh, archipelago uh, book is arranged in a completely different way. It's arranged um, geographically because he thought uh, his readers would be uh, confused uh, because of the convoluted nature of his travels when he kept on going back to the same island multiple times, et cetera. Um, if he had done it chronologically, 
it would yeah just be confused so he grouped all the incidents that had happened in one place um together um into a section um so that uh, people could more logically follow um uh, his story so um when he was working through this book um quite a few years after he returned um from the malaya archipelago um he uh when he had dealt with a page he would cross it through so um that's why these pages are crossed through and um uh there's as i say four of these notebooks and it seems that the the final one which would have covered his trip to sumatra um is missing and we we don't have any record of it but um it's interesting to compare what he wrote in his notebook with the final version as it were the published version in his malay archipelago book uh the wording is pretty similar but um the details are are often different um and there's a, a nice passage um here on um uh i think it's this page yes starting at the bottom uh right hand uh page where it says 164 uh he he recounts his um uh, capture of uh, the magnificent Wallace's uh, golden birdwing butterfly. And he says, on my forest walk into the forest, forests of Batchan, I saw a very large black butterfly marked with white and yellow spots, which I had once knew was a new species of the giant ornithoptera, the birdwing butterflies, the pride of the Indian archipelago. I was very anxious to get it and to find the male, which, uh, which in this genus is always of extreme beauty. At length, after two months and a half, I hit upon a flowering shrub which attracted these noble insects and after a few days watching obtained both the male and female. The latter I was delighted to find to be a perfectly new and most magnificent insect, perhaps the most gorgeously coloured butterfly in existence. Large specimens are upward of seven inches across the wings and are velvety black and fiery orange which replaces the green of um, O. Priamus and is a new color in the genus. The brilliancy of this color is indescribable and none but a naturalist can appreciate the intense excitement I experienced on at length capturing it. On taking out from my net and opening the glorious wings, my heart be um, beat violently, the blood rushed to my head and I have, um, I have been never so near fainting when in apprehension of instant death as from the excitement produced by what will to most people appear a very absurd and inadequate cause. I escaped, however, with a headache for the rest of the day, so that even butterfly chasing is not without its perils to the enthusiastic naturalist. So, yep, thank you, thank you, Will. Um, I think Will's gonna say a few more things about this book. Oh, I don't have much to say, really. I suppose one of the nice things about the Linnaean Lens series is you get to see the sort of materiality of the of the book up close and uh, it was just a an observation as we were handling this material that these are actually new covers this is um a, a, an item that's been recently conserved and we were just remarking that um the new paper actually bears a very strong resemblance to the original cover which we have here obviously it's been through the wars as you can see but it's been retained for its historic interest. You can see um, uh, Wallace's uh, sort of contents notes on the front. But um, I thought that was a pretty good match between the modern and the historic covers, all things considered. Um, these items have been photographed, I think I'm right in saying, and digitized and can be seen on Linnaean online. So please do feel free to have a look in your own time. Um, I think that's all I had to say. Well, um, one thing um, to say is that the um, um, Linnaean has a list of um, various items from Wallace that they would really like um, to be able to conserve, but obviously conservation is um, costly. So um, I'm sure if you, uh, I don't know, uh, email um, Isabel or maybe look on the website that um, there's details of uh the items that are at risk that uh, that's right this is part of our sort of bicentenary effort really in, in addition to these beautiful notebooks the Linnaean received about 300 books from Wallace's uh personal library a couple of years after his death um uh and 
Um, they, they've been a sort of prized part of our collection since then. But many of the volumes uh, show evidence of enthusiastic use, I think it's fair to say, and some of them are in need of um, a bit of TLC. So I think one of my colleagues will post the link into the, into the event chat. Um, and yes, if, if we were able to see that collection restored, um, that would be a wonderful way to mark this bicentenary, I think. In fact, I think, um, Will, is the trolley next to you? Yeah. I think just to show you where we're in the office here and the trolley next to uh, Will has uh, got some of the... Um, some of the books that are all from uh, Wallace's library that have been earmarked as needing uh, um, conservation. Uh, so, um, and I will put a link on the uh, on the chat um, presently about our Adoplin uh, program. Uh, I, I, I shan't eat into the questions too much, but this is just an example of an item from Wallace's library. This one's actually not in, in such bad condition. This is a book called Darwinian Fallacies by a man called uh, Jay Schooler. And you can see um, an annotation from Wallace here on the title page. He's not impressed. He says, rubbish from beginning to end, ARW. Um, uh, this is a, a sort of flavor of, of Wallace interacting with his library books. And um, it would be really wonderful to, to be able to make these books more widely available because they are in a slightly precarious condition. I think it's fair to say some of them. This one's OK. but. Um, but, but yes, I, I shan't take up any more time because I'm sure there are lots of questions. Thank you, Will. And thank you so much, George, for, uh, for a, a nice two-part uh, presentations. There are some questions in the Q&A, so we'll get to them now. We've got, um, we've got a bit of time. Uh, so I, there were quite a few questions uh, and answers going on in the Q&A, which has helped. Um, there, well, maybe let's start with the provenance question, which I uh, should be able to reply to, but perhaps uh, you will be able to, uh, George, because I'm not sure I know, apart from the fact that Wallace was a fellow of the Linnean Society. Um, one of those questions is, how did Linnean acquire these notebooks? Ah, um, yeah, I, I know that. Um, it was, they were actually <coughs> donated to the Society by Wallace's son and daughter, uh, William and Violet, after Wallace's death. So, um, uh, spe well, especially William uh, was uh, very, very good at finding good homes for Wallace's important um, uh, manuscripts, etc. So he gave um, the British Library um, basically all of Wallace's scientific letters, um, and he gave um, the Linnaean um, Wallace's, uh, you know, published li uh, books in his library with annotations, plus the notebooks and some other uh, material, including the um, manuscript of Palms of the Amazon. And he gave the Royal Geographical Society um, sort of various items, the Royal Society got Wallace's revolving book stand, which they can't find, uh, et cetera. And yeah, the Royal Geographical Society got Wallace's favorite armchair, but they can't find that either. <laughs> um, anyway, there's there's various letters um, which are actually in uh, my uh, letter Wallace um, the Wallace correspondence um, database online called Epsilon, um, documenting you know the story of what happened to Wallace's possessions after his death. Excellent, thank you so much. So there's quite a few questions. I'm going to try and take the um, the ones on the notebooks and more practical uh, ways of working from Wallace first, and then I'll take the, uh, uh, the the ones that are more linked to biology and his uh, theory of evolution. Um, uh, one of those questions related to the actual notebooks is relative to the first notebook shown, it looks like Wallace is recording in both ink and pencil. Is this correct? If so, how was uh, how well has the pencil notes held up? In fact, I think it's safe to say that a lot of the annotations that we have in Wallace Library's books are mostly in pencil rather than pen. Well, I mean, just thinking about it, graphite is chemically stable, you know, compound of um, carbon, so uh, it shouldn't ever fade. Um, so the pencil notes should be fine unless they're braided off the, the paper. Uh, and someone is asking about uh, the line through. I think the uh, the internet went off, at least for someone, as you explained what the lines were when the lines uh, through the the text in the um, in the yeah, third that, one there. That, that, those were just pages. Um, well, 
uh, Wallace was crossing through the pages as he dealt with them. So when he was actually writing his uh, book, The Malay Archipelago, and he took information from the page of the journal, and once he had dealt with it, he, he put a line through it. Uh, thank you. Uh, did Wallace ever use a camera? Uh, no, there's no records um, of him ever using a camera, although he was um, photographed by his brother-in-law, Thomas Sims, from quite early on. Um, there's a picture of him uh, before he went uh, to the Amazon. And then um, Sims and other people took quite a few pictures of him um, throughout his life. Um, but I, I've never heard of him using camera. And, uh, he wouldn't have taken one to the Malay Archipelago because at that time, uh, the cameras, was, cameras were massive plate cameras. Although he, he met the Woodbury brothers in Java who had a, a photographic studio there and they actually traveled around the Malay Archipelago taking amazing pictures of places and people. Um, Wallace bought a set of their um, photographs and uh, some of those are in the Natural History Museum's archive now. Interesting, thank you. Um, so uh, let's take some of the uh, more biological questions. Is it true that unlike Darwin, Wallace did not believe that natural selection applied to humans? No, that's um, completely false. In fact, uh, Darwin complimented Wallace on his um, paper on man. Um, and uh, he based uh, the arguments that Wallace made in that paper um, in the anthropological journal, I think it was, um, uh, were basically the basis of Darwin's um, book, uh, Descent of uh, Man. And uh, one of Wallace's arguments was that uh, evolution of the human body has probably more or less stopped uh, because of cultural evolution, that humans um, have managed to, um, you know, become obviously evolve great intelligence and ideas are now passed from person to person. And they, you know, what Dawkins calls memes, uh, they, you know, go from mind to mind and mutate and change. And um, uh, rather than, you know, G, the genes changing um, so much to match the environment, it's the technology that humans um, now depend on that um, masters the environment. And so, yeah, he believed in sort of cultural technological evolution um, and uh, you know, sort of stabilizing uh, the human uh, body. Um, but he, he certainly believed that humans had evolved from, you know, earlier ancestors. In fact, he, he thought that humans had actually uh, evolved in Asia. He thought that the orangutan was probably the closest living relative to humans. And strangely enough, uh, the modern um, thought is that probably a lot of human evolution was actually done in Asia, uh, that uh, primitive Homo erectus uh, migrated out of Africa, um, went to the far um, east of China and to Java, and that uh, there was a lot of evolutionary change that then took place in those areas. And then the you know the genes or populations moved back to Africa. Um, so um, it's not a, a simple story. And I think Darwin and Wallace were probably partly right. So Darwin believed that uh, humans had totally evolved in in Africa. Uh, but Wallace couldn't believe it because he thought that Africa was an isolated island um, during the time that humans were evolving. Um, but yeah, so yeah, Wallace certainly uh, believed the natural selection applied to humans. Very interesting, especially about the orangutan, actually. If you look at Linnaeus's classification of human, it briefly comes into it. Uh, of, obviously, it's much earlier, but yeah. Anyway, I won't go into that right now. There's too many questions to go through. Um, there's a couple of questions about the Wallace line um, and how, um, how it holds up to our modern understanding in particular. Um, and uh, um, someone asked a question, what other factors that uh, may affect the differences between the species of the Bali with Lombok beside the island barrier based on Wallace's findings? Uh, I'm not and, sure. and, ba and basically how it holds up to, to modern uh, Well, it holds up extremely well, but it's um, not so cut and dry as all of that. In fact, um, starting um, with the, the Wallace line that goes between you know, Borneo and, um, um, and Sulawesi and then Bali and Lombok. Uh, if you go um, east of that, uh, there's a, a sort of a transition zone between the faunas of Asia um, 
that are to the west and the fauna of uh, Australasia. And uh, that uh, there's a mixture um, of um, species from both sides. Um, and it becomes more and more sort of Australian as you get uh, further east. And that whole uh, transition region has been named Wallacea. So I'm always pleased that Wallace has got a bigger chunk of the world named after him than Darwin. <laughs> Darwin's got a town and quite a few other things. But anyway, Wallacea, um, yeah, is a sort of a transition zone. So it's uh, complicated. Some, some creatures aren't affected by the sea barriers as other creatures are. So even within mammals, um, certain um, mammals um, have evidently got across water barriers more easily than other species. So elephants are well known for having been able to cross uh, large distances between islands. They're kind of neutrally buoyant and they stick their trunks out of the water. And they've got to all kinds of remote islands in the, that were in the Mediterranean and um, in um, Indonesia, um, which were never connected by dry land. Um, but certain other um, types of mammal, um, for instance, uh, rhinos or tigers, apparently um, they haven't managed to cross water barriers. So you, if you pick the groups right, you can see the kind of signal in the noise, but there's a lot of noise and Wallace was able to pick out the signal. Um, but he, he actually believed um, his explanation of why there was the pattern there in the first place is actually wasn't isn't correct. Um, he he based it on Charles Lyell's view of geology. Um, in those days, they didn't know about plate tectonics. So, uh, but Lyell uh, just believed that land went up and down. So, um, and the amount of uh, land, the depth of uh, the sea floor. Uh, was correlated by the amount of time that say the sea floor was, had been sinking. So Wallace knew that uh, the seas were very shallow uh, to the west of the line. They were only about a hundred or so meters um, deep. And he believed that uh, that indicated that the, the land that had connected all of those islands had only been sinking for a relatively short amount of time. Whereas the uh, islands uh, to the east uh, had very deep water. And in fact, the the, there's a trench between where the Wallace line is that's very, very, very deep. And he thought that that meant that basically the seafloor had been sinking for an extremely long time. And that um, accounts for why, uh, you know, animals weren't able to move from one side to another. But as I said, it's very complicated. And you don't see many good patterns, say, with plants, because um, often plants can, you know, be easily transported by seeds and things um, across water barriers. Thank you, George. Um, I'm aware of the time. Uh, we are probably going to run over slightly. I'm going to just uh, reply to one question that is uh, about displaying of the items, just to say that there will be a Wallace themed display in the in the Linnean Society Library here at Burlington House from um, uh, end of May, beginning of June. Um, so if you want to come in, then you're very welcome. Um, there are two questions related to uh, peoples of the Malay archipelago uh, and uh, asking for um, more about uh, what was uh, Wallace's, what, what, who were Wallace's assistant, who helped him to collect samples, uh, how they worked together and whether Wallace wrote further about these uh, cultures? Well, um, Wallace was particularly interested in, in humans in, in general. And uh, that's why the long title, the full title of his book, The Malay Archipelago, was Studies of Man and Nature. Um, you know, he put man in there. Um, but he is renowned for being extremely respectful um, of the local cultures which he lived among, unlike Darwin, who lived on the Beagle and spent relatively short periods of time on land. Wallace spent um, a lot of time on land and had to live with uh, local people. And um, he uh, was fascinated by their cultures. And he actually was a pioneering anthropologist. And a friend of mine in Brazil has just done a whole PhD um, thesis on this about um, Wallace's observations of the in Indians of Brazil and said that Wallace's methods were remarkably modern. 
and um, unlike other people's uh, methods at the time, he was much more respectful um, of their culture and much more interested in etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah, um, getting to the other part of the question, uh, Wallace employed a huge number of um, paid assistants when he was in um, uh, the Malay archipelago, um, some of whom accompanied him uh, extensively on his travels, and some of them were just uh, employed in you know one place. But uh, the main assistant of all of them was um, a young Malay uh, lad called Ali, and Wallace employed him um, early on in the trip when Wallace was in um, uh, Sarawak in Borneo, and Ali accompanied Wallace uh, through the whole of the rest of the trip. And he became a very experienced bird collector and skinner of uh, bird skins. Um, and as I mentioned in my talk, Wallace basically um, focused mainly on the insects, um, which, you know, you can't just collect randomly. You need a lot of knowledge to be able to say, well, that butterfly is interesting and I'll collect it, um, rather than, you know, just collect every single butterfly you see and then you end up with hundreds of the same species. Um, but uh, Ali, um, yeah, was one of the, the collectors who specialized um, on birds. And I think he was one of the few that actually was able to skin them and prepare decent um, scientific uh, bird skins. And uh, yeah, Wallace mentions Ali and his other collectors a huge amount in his book, much more than um, is the case with other um, explorers of the time. And he mentions a lot of these people by name and if you do a search through his book for Ali, you'll see him mentioned dozens of times. And he clearly really respected and, you know, had a high regard for Ali and rescued Ali several times when Ali was dangerously ill and Ali did the same to Wallace. And at the end of his trip, um, he took Ali with him to Singapore and gave him, besides a big gift of money, um, all his valuable guns and other equipment, um, which apparently made Ali a, a very rich man. Thank you, uh, George. Let's stay a little bit with social history. Um, someone asked, did Wallace's family join him on, every, on his trips abroad? Um, actually, his, his um, uh, <clears throat> younger brother, Herbert, joined him in Brazil. Uh, Herbert was kind of a romantic poet, and, but he thought that if he went to Brazil uh, with Wallace, uh, he could earn a living collecting specimens. He just didn't he obviously didn't know what was involved and it turned into a bit of a, a nightmare for him. Uh, he wrote a lot of poems when he was in the Amazon, but uh, then decided to, um, I think, return home. But before he, he could get on a ship, he actually died of yellow fever. And uh, Wallace didn't find out about this for several months because he was up, I think, the Rio Negro. But Henry Walter Bates um, looked after Herbert um, as he was um, you know, dying. There was a, an outbreak of yellow fever and Wallace was obviously devastated when he found out, um, which, but as I said, it was sometime later, unfortunately. And Herbert is now buried in Brazil. We know the churchyard where uh, Herbert's body was um, laid to rest. Thank you. Uh, there's a few questions. There's a few more questions. <laughs> Uh, some of them might be quite hefty, actually. Why, why did Wallace and uh, Darwin disagree about sexual selection? Okay, well, I'll try and tackle that one. Basically, Darwin um, believed that um, female animals uh, had a concept of beauty, and they chose males um, just because they were the most beautiful. Uh, Wallace could never accept that. He couldn't imagine that the almost microscopic brain of a beetle um, uh, was choosing males because they thought, wow, that male is particularly attractive. Because that sort of implies a whole nother set of, you know, almost consciousness to be able to appreciate um, vivid colors for just the sake of vivid, vivid colors. So Wallace disagreed for that reason. And in fact, um, devised a completely different uh, reason for the, the, the colors that they were in some, uh, for various reasons fitter, there were indications of fitness. So in some cases it was obvious, like the horns of antelope, um, the bigger horns um, you know, were carried by bigger males, stronger males that would outcompete, um, you know, small, smaller males with smaller horns, but uh, that 
he believed that the colors um, actually were correlated in some way to fitness as well. Although he didn't chance upon um, the correct, well, what we think today of being the correct um, explanations. Um, so today, um, uh, the theory of sexual selection, whereas whilst it's called the Darwin's theory, it's actually not Darwin's theory, it's mostly Wallace's theory. And there's very few people in the world now who believe in Darwin's version of sexual selection. Virtually everyone who works on sexual selection long ago abandoned Darwin's ideas and believe in um, Wallace's better genes idea. So sexual selection is um, basically natural selection and females are choosing fitter males. So in the case of Birds of Paradise, um, it might be what's called the handicap hypothesis where uh, it's better, well, better with a peacock example. So um, there's an idea called the handicap hypothesis, which says that um, females choose males with bigger and bigger tails because only the, the fittest males um, of the species can afford to have the big tails and be able to, in spite of having the big tails, avoid being eaten by predators like tigers, etc. So if the a female has a massive to uh, long tail bigger than its rivals, you know that that's probably uh, a fitter male, stronger in other ways. It's, it's sort of a badge of fitness. Um, and females are choosing the longer tails for that reason. Uh, there's also another idea about uh, bright colors showing up illness. And so if uh, a male um, has immaculate um, plumage, um, then the female will know that that male was healthy. Um, and so, et cetera, et cetera. But most of the ideas of sexual select selection are now uh, Wallace's um, uh, version of sexual selection. And that's actually, unfortunately, what's happened to many of Wallace's ideas, like the biological species concept, which people are always taught was originated by Ernst Meyer. <clears throat> but it wasn't, it was originated by Wallace in his um, monograph of the swallowtail butterflies um, of the Malay archipelago in about in the 1870s. And Meyer was very familiar with Wallace's work and must have picked it up from there. And even actually the whole idea of adaptive evolutionary change, I'll be controversial here. Uh, Wallace's um, theory of um, adaptive evolutionary change was actually much more um, accurate and uh, um, Sim uh, basically identical to the modern theory uh, than Darwin's was because Darwin always believed that there were two mechanisms operating um, during evolution, um, natural selection, which he and Wallace uh, both um, simultaneously published the idea of, but uh, Darwin always believed um, Lamar in Lamarckian selection. And there's a whole chapter of his origin species um, uh, devoted to the evolution of um, and of acquired characteristics, characteristics acquired during the life of the parent. And he even invented an, a whole hypothesis of how it could work, his um, hypothesis of pangenesis, which was published in his uh, book, Animals and Plants Under Domestication, where he said that each cell of the body produced little microscopic gemmules, which gave information about the cell, and then they, these all moved down to the reproductive organs. So, uh, Characteristics could be passed on like bigger biceps of um, a blacksmith or whatever. But Wallace, um, from right at the beginning, from the 1858 essay, the Tonate essay, he totally rejected Lamarckism. And, you know, um, there's a whole big section about uh, Lamarckism and how it's a load of rubbish. And he maintained that throughout his life and had numerous discussions with Darwin and other people and encourage people to do experiments to disprove uh, Lamarckism, um, which pe were then done by people like um, Weissmann in Germany, um, where they did things like they cut off the tails of mice over generations to see if short or no tails could be inherited and found that they, they couldn't. So anyway, it's a whole, it could make a, an interesting PhD subject studying, you know, um, this difference in, um, the two men's uh, theories of adaptive evolution. Um, there's tons of information in the unpublished writings and un unpublished writings, but no one's ever dealt with it properly before. 
Thank you, George. I'm aware we're five, six minutes over time. Uh, George has kindly agreed to kind of go all the way up to maybe quarter past three. Um, so we'll take a couple more questions, but I appreciate if people have to go. Um, there are, uh, well, there's, there's more questions about uh, Darwin and, um, but I might leave them there uh, for the moment, just to say, there's a couple of questions about um, traveling and the influence of uh, Humboldt, for example. Um, uh, and whether Humboldt, uh, whether Wallace read Humboldt and had as high an opinion of him as Darwin did. And I'm going to, I'm going to twin, I'm going to couple this question with another uh, question about the about traveling because I think Humboldt was, uh, you know, uh, uh, the source of inspiration for a lot of uh, traveling that occurred uh, after him. Uh, and what convinced uh, Wallace to get back on a ship after after the, his disaster in the Atlantic? Um, yes, he was definitely inspired by Humboldt and also by Darwin's um, uh, Voyage of the Beagle, as it was later called. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, Charles Smith has written a paper about Humboldt's influence on Wallace. Um, uh, Humboldt was, you know, just mega famous um, at, that, at that time. Um, there's apparently more um, things, more geographical things named after Humboldt than any other person in history around the world. Um, he, he was seriously a, a mega star um, worldwide. And yeah, Wallace really, really admired him as well. And the second part of the question, why, oh, why did he go to the Malay archipelago? And that's because um, the specimens from half of, you know, the time he spent in the Amazon uh, had been destroyed when his ship sunk. So for the first two years, he sent back specimens that got back okay. But um, the real special specimens were from the upper reaches of the Rio Negro. Um, he, he knew that he had hundreds of new butterfly species and all kinds of things. And those are the ones that went down with the ship. Uh, so the, the other earlier specimens were from places that people had collected before. So there was relatively little of interest. And um, he was pursuing this whole idea of, you know, how evolution worked. He was totally obsessed by it. And so I think there were two reasons why he decided to go to the Malay archipelago. Um, first being that um, that was a way of making money, um, earning his you know, making his living, but also to continue working um, on trying to understand evolution. And he picked the Malay archipelago because it was an area of the world which uh, there were very few specimens and least in British collections because that whole region, especially the region that's now Indonesia was controlled by the Dutch. So there, there might've been specimens in Dutch museums, but certainly not in, in British museums. So that made him want to go there. Thank you, George. Um, three more questions. Uh, hopefully we can get to them in the next five minutes. Uh, how did Wallace react to the discovery of Eight Man in Java by Eugène Dubois? Um, I, I think it was discovered after um, Wallace's death. I know that Neanderthals had been discovered, um, but they were kind of misidentified as an ill ill Cossack soldier or something, remains of an ill Cossack soldier. <laughs> um, uh, but um, I, I'm not quite sh sure I should know, but I think that, um, I think that a Java man, Homo erectus in Java was discovered by Dubois after Wallace died or at least very near his death. But the interesting thing is that I know also that Wallace, uh, Dubois had been inspired by Wallace's writings. Uh, Wallace saying that, he thought that um, humans had originated in, in Asia rather than Africa. And that was one of the reasons he, he went there. Um, and he was exceedingly lucky in actually finding the skull cap and um, bones of, you know, Homo erectus uh, on Java. Um, I mean, what is the chance of that happening? Mm. Incredibly low. Um, so yeah, on the banks of the Solo River. Um, thank you. Uh, this perhaps is a meaty question, so I'll leave it up to you how much you want to <laughs> answer it. Uh, is the process of speciation uh, in danger? And if yes, then why? Uh, no, I don't think that it's in danger. Well, it, it could be in danger in one way that um, so many species are basically on the, the verge of extinction. So obviously, if they go extinct, they're not going to um, speciate in the those lineages will go and there'll be no more species from those lineages in the future. 
<clears throat> but strangely enough, uh, it's occurred to me that in some ways, the humans fragmenting the environment might encourage speciation in the long term, uh, because speciation often uh, occurs faster when there's uh, smaller populations in fragmented habitats, so there's no gene flow uh, between one place and the next. Um, but you know, speciation is you know still pretty slow in in things that are on bacteria and viruses. Um, so uh, I would probably guess that the humans would wipe out those little patches of habitat um, uh, before anything before. interesting happened. So yeah, thank you. Um... And I, the, I left the last question as it's kind of a what if question. Um, might Darwin have never published Origins of Species without the competition from Wallace arriving at similar theories? Uh, that is entirely um, possible. Uh, the other thing is, if you sort of noted in my talk that Wallace was doubly responsible for Origin of Species, his 1855 paper um, inspired uh, Lyle to prompt Darwin to start writing for publication. So he thought Wallace might beat Darwin. And uh, Darwin was part way through this book, um, which he had started because of it, uh, when Wallace's um, paper arrived. So if Darwin hadn't had uh, that huge manuscript uh, already done, um, he wouldn't have been able to abstract it to produce Origin of Species. And the chance of Wallace actually sending his um, his paper manuscript on natural selection to Darwin, that was exceedingly bad luck. Uh, you could look at it in that way for uh, Wallace because Darwin was the only person in probably the entire world, you know, who had come up with basically the identical um, mm. idea. So um, Wallace, uh, Darwin kind of, in, and Darwin's friends sort of intercepted it. Normally uh, Wallace would send all his manuscripts direct to journals for publication. They wouldn't go through, um, somebody else but in this one case um he sent you know the the, the paper uh, to darwin actually asking darwin to pass it on to lyle if if he had known lyle him, himself he would have written directly and sent it to lyle because he was having this sort of argument with lyle's ideas but anyway so yeah that's that's what happened darwin was extremely lucky um how it all turned out uh, but Wallace didn't, you know, really resent uh, the fact that, you know, he co-authored the idea with um, Darwin, although the sad thing is that most people have forgotten about that, you know, nowadays. Well, if you come to a tour of the society, we, uh, we tend to show both portraits of Darwin and Wallace at the same time, because they're in our meeting room next to each other. Um, thank you so much, George. That was uh, absolutely brilliant. Uh, and thank you for your, your time and, uh, and your wealth of knowledge and sharing that with us. Um, I'm just going to end. Will, if you want to grab one of the L50, if L50s, that's just behind you. I forgot to do it before. <laughs> um, several, uh, George has actually written in our uh, uh, book of treasures about um, Wallace. So if you're interested in purchasing this uh, uh, book of treasures, it's called L50, um, 50 stories uh, and objects from our collections. It was published two years ago and it's available on our website. And I think it's probably too late to put a link, although I know Will is just trying to do that very quickly. Thank you so much for joining us. Our next um, Linnean Lens on Wallace will be in July, uh, and we may have another one in the meantime in, in May that um, we're thinking about. Um, thank you, uh, and thank you, George, um, and goodbye, everyone. Bye.